Good evening. Welcome to another session of Biblical Insights. Tonight we're looking at Isaiah chapter 35. Remember I told you that uh, Isaiah naturally divides itself into two parts kind of parallel to the Old and the New Testaments? 35 kind of is a transitional uh, chapter between those two divisions. Chapter 34 is a warning, a woe against the nations that are giving Israel uh, difficult times. And then chapter 35 goes into uh, a beautiful prophecy of God's redeeming power and points sort of to uh, the new millennium, the millennial kingdom. So tonight we want to look at uh, chapter 35. It's a short chapter, just uh, 10 verses, but oh so powerful. So let's, uh, let's look at it and let's read verses 1 and 2. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It'll blossom profusely and rejoice with a rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of our God. Remember chapter 34 is a prophecy uh, against the nations. Now the nations are, are the Gentile countries. Whenever we read nations, it generally refers to uh, the Gentile countries. It describes uh, the destruction, the barrenness. Now we go into chapter 35, and it describes a complete transformation, a redemption, if you will. It shows in the two verses we read that the desert actually transformed. Back in chapter 34, I think it was verse uh, 9, it talked about the streams being turned into pitch and uh, the sands being turned into pitch and the jackals and the dragons living there. It was a complete desolation. Now, when it talks about a solitary place, remember Isaiah's talking uh, to a physical country, but he's talking spiritually as well. And I think I want our incense our insights to focus on those spiritual applications. Now, in Barnes' commentary, he talks about uh, the words for solitary place, the Araba, often refers in Scripture to moral and spiritual desolation. Couldn't you say we're living in a culture like that today? moral and spiritual, a desert, moral desert, spiritual desert. But now in this chapter, we read of the desert blooming, uh, certainly a transformation, blooming like a crocus. I kind of like the King James uh, there. It says, well, blossom as a rose. Uh, we like roses in this culture because it represents the finest of the flowers. So the desert will bloom suddenly from pitch to a blooming desert. I like that, don't you? This is the transformation. He speaks of the promise of reformation, of redemption. Verse 2 kind of elaborates on this theme and talks about some beautiful places. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, you probably visited some of these. He's first mentioned Lebanon. Now, I haven't been to Lebanon, but I know one of the majesties of Lebanon is its cedars. And uh, I re remember reading that Solomon brought cedars from Lebanon to help build the temple. Uh, they're majestic. So we talk about the majesty of Lebanon. Then he speaks of the beauty of Carmel. Now, we were privileged on our visit to Israel to travel by bus. 
we came to the top of Mount Carmel, looking down at Haifa and out across the Mediterranean, and it is truly a beautiful sight. You can see some of those sites if you go to uh, places like Google Maps and look at Israel. Beautiful sites. And then he also mentioned the Plain of Sharon. Now, the Plain of Sharon is that plain between the Mediterranean Sea and the hills uh, leading up to Jerusalem. And he talks about the fertility of Sharon. Certainly a beautiful place as well. So a transformed desert, a place of beauty. So let's look again now, this time at verses 3 and 4. It kind of changes the tune a little bit, and it says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Now I like the King James Version of that verse because it says, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. I like it because it refers to parts of the body. Chapter 4 says, Say to those with an anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. I like that, don't you? Uh, now, the reason I kind of like the King James Version, Barnes reminds us that uh, she quivering hands and knocking knees uh, are a picture of one who's frightened. And when we shift our trust from God, and Isaiah talks a lot about that in the first part of the book, when we begin to look at conditions around us, the barrenness around us, and we begin to let that affect our faith, we become weak. We become like the picture that is described here, the shaking hands and the knocking knees. Verse 4 instructs us, leaders or even lay leaders, people of God, to encourage, to instruct them, to do all we can to encourage those who are weak. And God will come. And he says he'll come with vengeance. I like that. A lot of times we think of vengeance as coming with a with a punishment, and certainly he'll do that. But I kind of, to me, it suggests he's coming with a zeal. He's coming with a, uh, with a power. He'll come with vengeance. Our God will save you. I like that. So don't let the fear of what's going around you weaken you and give you this weakened situation that's talked about here. Okay, five and six. Again, the theme changes. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame man will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. Now, then the desert, or then the lame man shall leap as in heart. When... When is then? It, it, it definitely says that at the beginning of the verse. But when is then? Let me suggest to you, it's when the Messiah comes. It's when Christ comes. Now, this is true historically, but it's true spiritually as well. When Jesus came... Remember, there's a passage in Matthew 11 when John the Baptist sent his disciples. John was in prison, but he sent his disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one that, was, that is to come? Now, let me read Jesus' response to you. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preach to them. It's as if Jesus were answering almost from the book of Isaiah. It's like he was saying, I am here. It's happening. So he did. We read over and over about uh, the lame being healed, the deaf being changed, the deaf hearing. 
Then, as we read the book of Acts, Jesus gave his apostles the authority to perform this kind of miracles. And we see that happening as we read the book of Acts. I remember one incident where Jesus healed a man possessed of devils who could not speak. And the disciples asked him, why couldn't we do that? You know, Samphus, why couldn't we do that? They couldn't do that on their own. Jesus answered them, this kind come not out except by prayer. Some translations add at fasting. So as long as they did it in the power of God, they did the same thing. Now let me ask you a question here. Could it be if we could leave that position of the weak hands and feeble knees, put aside all of those disturbing things that happen in our society that comes at us through the media, if we could focus on the power of God, if we could put our trust totally in Him, might we be able to do and see more miracles than we see now? Another thought that came to be as I was reading this, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. What are the eyes and ears? They're the way we receive information. A lot of times in scripture, we read, uh, you hear, but you listen, but you do not hear. You see, but you don't understand. It's a picture of the, of the man and the people of Jesus' day who were so focused on other things that Jesus talked to. In fact, he said he spoke in parables lest they hear and understand. So when, we, when those healings, when we begin to see and we begin to hear and understand, we begin to take in the Word of God and let it empower us. Now look at the last two things. Then the lame man shall leap as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. What did Jesus instruct his people to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. How do we go with our knees, with our legs? How do we speak, preach the gospel with our mouth? So I think there's kind of a hidden uh, lesson there in this healing. When Christ comes into our lives, our eyes are open, our ears are unstopped, and we're commanded to go and tell. I like that, don't you? Okay, let's move on to verses 6 and 7, or actually the last half of verse 6 and 7. He says, Waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah, streams in the desert. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. Remember we talked about the sand, the stream becoming pitch and the place where jackals and, and uh, wild animals dwell. I'm particularly intrigued by the first couple of words there in verse 7. It says, the parched ground shall become as a pool. Now the Hebrew word kind of suggests the shimmering heat. If you've been to the desert, even sometimes looking down a hot pavement, you see uh, the heat waves shimmering. And if you're in the desert and you're thirsty, as you often would be, and you see this, it appears as a pool. I read of one man who said he was in the desert and he was so convinced it was a pool. He knew all about mirages, but he was convinced that this was the real thing until he got there and it turned into sand. 
and the parched ground, the mirage. In fact, uh, the uh, complete Jewish Bible translates that verse. The sandy mirage will become a pool. So the mirage will become. So I have to ask myself, what mirage is drawing me? You see, a mirage makes those thirsty people think they can find happiness in there. Now, in our culture, it's a culture of mirages. People are chasing dreams, chasing thirsts they can never satisfy. What are some of those mirages? Riches, money, power, political office, sex, drugs. But you know what? When they get there, they'll never find happiness. I read the words, the dying words of a man whose name you would recognize was one of the richest men in America, said his dying words, I wish I had focused more on relationships than I did on money. So whatever the mirage, here's, here's the clue, here's the insight. When Christ comes into your life, your desires change. You desire his will. You worship him. And he is a pool of water that satisfies. So folks, we got to stop chasing mirages and look to the one, the only one, who can truly satisfy. The reference in that second verse, the haunt of jackals shall become grass and reeds and rushes. Reeds and rushes suggest to me fertility and moisture, fullness. That's the transformation that will happen when Christ comes, ultimately in the millennial kingdom, but today when he comes into our lives. Now let's move on to eight and nine. We're getting close to the end of the chapter. Again, the scene that kind of changes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the Highway of Holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor any vicious beast go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed, the redeemed shall walk there. Scholars tell us that this highway spoken of is a raised roadway. It's a contrast to what normally is found in the desert, the, the path that sometimes leads into nothingness. You ever follow a road like that that ends up nowhere? But this is a highway. This is, if you will, an interstate, a freeway. And I want to mention four things about this that I think is true. The Bible kind of gives us the hint. First of all, it's a sure way. It'll take you where you want to go. God has a plan. You walk on the highway of holiness, you're going to get where he, where he leads you and wants you to go. The Bible says it'll be for him that walks this way and fools will not wander on. It's for the holiness man, the one who worships God. It's a select way. He says the unclean won't travel there, nor any beast shall be there. It's designed for the man who worships the Christ. It's a secure way. It's safe. No lion shall be found there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up there on. They shall not be found there, the King James says. It's a joyful way. We'll talk more about that in verse 10. Now, I want to pause a minute before we go to verse 10 and talk about that word redeemed. But the redeemed shall walk there. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, 
the Hebrew word is Galal or Goel. In the Old Testament, in the book of the law, the Torah, there is the law of the Goel, which says if a married woman's husband dies and leaves her without a son, the law says that a brother of the husband must take her to wife and give her a son in order to carry on the name, the family name. He redeems that wife. He redeems that family name. So I like that picture. We read about that in the book of Ruth. For Ruth, a Gentile, by the way, came back to Israel, back to the Holy Land with Naoma, her mother-in-law. Remember, she said, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Whether you go, I will go. Whether you stay, I will stay. So she came back with, with Neoma, and she met this kinsman by the name of Boaz. And Boaz loved her. But in the end, Boaz went to the nearest relative who had the first right to marry her. And he gave up that right. Boaz married her and redeemed the family name. Now it just so happens that the grandson of Ruth and Boaz was David, the king to whom God made the covenant that there would always be one of his family one of his descendants on the throne of Israel. Also, Jesus was the Messiah of David. In the line of David, Jesus is the Messiah who will be forever on the throne when he comes back. So the kinsman redeemer, Jesus is often called the kinsman redeemer. So that's a beautiful picture of the redeemed shall walk. He has redeemed us. The other thing I mentioned about redemption, <clears throat> when Moses led the children out of Egypt, God instructed them to build a tabernacle, a place where they would keep the Ark of the Covenant where God would live among them. I gave them specific instructions. Also in the 38th chapter of Exodus, we read where Moses took up a tax of a half a shekel from every man over 20. That was called a redemption tax, by the way. There were 603,550 men over 20, each with a half a shekel. So the Bible tells us the collection came to 100 talents of silver plus 1,775 shekels left over. Now, the 100 talents of silver was basically used in the construction of of the tabernacle, of the of the tabernacle within the enclosure. It tells us that each there were ten boards to a side, no twenty boards to a side, I'm sorry. Each was a cubit and a half. Now put those side by side. They were mounted upright in the ground. 20 times a cubit and a half, you get 30 cubits. The Bible tells us each side was 30 cubits. The back side was 10 cubits, which was six boards and two extra in the corners. Each of these boards, cubit and a half wide, that's about 27 inches, was mounted on two sockets of silver, each socket weighing one talent. Now, a talent is about 75 pounds. 
So each board, there were 48 of them, set on 150 pounds of silver. Now here's something interesting. I checked the precious metals market and I find that today silver is selling for about uh, almost $20 an ounce. So a pound of silver is worth $320. A talent is 75 pounds, so a talent of silver is worth $2,400. A hundred talents of silver is worth $2.4 million. <clears throat> what a precious foundation for the tabernacle. Silver is a type of redemption. The picture we get is that our tabernacle, where Christ dwells among us, is built on redemption, silver. What a price! And yet our faith is built on redemption as well a redemption worth far more than $2.4 million. It was a redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. What a powerful picture. The redeemed shall walk there. Don't you love it? Verse 10, the last verse of the chapter. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy in their head upon their heads they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away joy I said we talk about joy in verse 10 didn't I they shall come to Zion now Zion is the center of Judah. It's the center of the kingdom of God, actually. When Jesus returns a second time as Messiah, he will make his headquarters in Zion, in Jerusalem. But I think it also speaks that when we come to Zion, when we return, when we get back to what God designed us for, to worship Him. We'll do it with joy. Everlasting joy on their heads, it says. Now this could refer to a couple of things. First of all, it could, it could refer to the expression on their face. I wonder why we have so many long-faced Christians. It should be joy. It could refer to the practice they had back then of anointing their heads with oil when they were joyful. In a celebration, there was an anointing. The shepherd psalm says, Thou anointest my head with oil. It's a time to rejoice. Or it could refer to the fact that many times in these joyful celebrations, they wore garlands of flowers on their heads. But it's everlasting joy. Joy should be the earmark of every true Christian. Every believer who puts his trust in the Messiah and casts away all the garbage that comes through us looks to him only will find joy. I hope you find joy in Christ today. Thank you for watching. It's been good to be with you again.